Thank you for watching the Table Community Church video podcast. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. Hey, good morning, y'all. Great to be with you this morning. Uh, let's stand and sing together. This up, I'd be hopeless. Sing that out.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. With your blood, you bought my freedom. Hallelujah for the cross. great king of glory seated on high in the heavens oh Jesus you alone you are the Lord God almighty you are the Lord God almighty strong in compassion and mercy oh Jesus, you alone. Search the world. I've searched the world for a love that could fill my heart. Nothing compared to the wonder of who you are. Holy, all the earth sing and holy. All the angels cry, holy Jesus, you alone, Jesus, you alone. Set the star. You set the stars in the heavens. You set the world into motion, oh. Jesus, you alone. Breathe your life. You breathe your life in creation. You walked among your created own. Jesus, you alone. When I search the world, and I search the world.
home. Holy all the earth singing, holy all the angels cry, holy Jesus, you alone sing worthy. You are worthy, all creation sings worthy, all the heavens exalt thee. Jesus, you alone. Jesus, you alone. Will you pray with me, Lord? We are um, humbled by who you are this morning. When we sing that song, when we sing that chorus, I can't um, see anything but your people singing in heaven to you at your right hand constant state of worship, a constant state of fulfillment that we did not get here on earth, that we constantly looked to and hoped for. And God, on that day when we leave this place, we enter your kingdom fulfilled, joyful. God, forgive us for going our own way. Forgive us for thinking we know best. Forgive us for causing disaccord out of our own pride or lack of knowledge. God, in all things, help us to press into you. In all things, help us to ask you. We are in such a crazy time right now where their own opinions on things and everyone thinks they know best but God you are the only one who knows so God we, we approach you this morning we sing to you this morning it's all we have to give you is our voices God we just pray that you continue to move in this space whether there be one person or 500 God that you might move and change and do the things that only you can do, that we might leave this place different than the way that we came in, that we might be convicted of things, that we might grow from those convictions, God. We love you, we approach you, we sing to you this morning. We love you so much, and it's in Jesus' name we pray.
say good morning and welcome you, uh, whether you're watching online or if you're here with us today. Uh, we're so thankful that you would worship with us this morning. Um, if, I wanted to welcome guests. If this is your first time, uh, you can text 817-755-1668 and you can just text welcome and we'll get in contact with you on how we can serve both you and your families. Uh, we want to make sure that we do that well. And so uh, I just was thinking, honestly, over the last few weeks, um, it's, it's kind of funny because when I was a kid growing up and hearing the story of, of the Israelites being led through the Red Sea, and then I see them on the other side of it, and we read the, about them on the other side of it, and we, we see their lives kind of unfold, and 
they begin to doubt God. And I always just kind of got frustrated with them. I'm like, you guys are crazy, right? Like, what did God just save you from? What has God done in your lives over the last few years? And you now, you find yourself in a position where you are doubting his goodness and his love and his faithfulness. And honestly, up until this last few months, I never really experienced that on my own. And just honestly, personally, I I have over the last few months. Just begin to ask God, like, God, where are you in the midst of all that's going on in this world? We need you. And just feeling at times, just in my own emotions, like, man, I just don't see him working. And then I remembered what God called them to do in, is to set up these stones, these monuments, these places of worship to, to remember, to point back to generations and say, this is what God has done. And the God who did this won't forget you. The God who did this is faithful. And so in my life, I just began to look back on things that he's done in my life, how he saved me at 12 years old, how he's delivered me from different sins in my life, how he's never left me, how he's always been faithful. And then I applied those testimonies to today, and I said, God, I trust you. I know that I can't see it, but I do believe that you're at work and you haven't left your kids. So be encouraged today. It's chaotic, it's hard, it's difficult, but he's not forgotten. He's with us. He's faithful. We will endure. It may look differently than we think it should or is supposed to, but God has never forgotten you, not once. So I just wanted you to be encouraged in that today. I know it's encouraged me, and so hopefully it does the same for you. We're going to continue in our Hero Maker series um, today. But before we do, would you take a look at this video? privilege of teaching in Table Kids, and this is my Hero Maker story. I serve in Table Kids because I feel that teaching kids is the most important area in our church. In our church family, we focus a lot on on adult ministries. We focus on teaching women, and we focus on teaching families and marriages. But the truth of the matter is, is that your foundation is built when you're a child. My parents started taking us to church when I was in first grade, and that happens to be the area that I teach in, in first and second grade. And I know having raised two children, and one just graduated from high school, and the other will be entering her freshman year in high school, that without a firm foundation, um, the storms of life are coming. And the best place to turn to is what you've been taught as a child. And so if we focus on the areas of adult ministry and teaching adults, we've missed the best place to build a foundation. Um, My family builds foundations as a a business. My parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents started a family business. And for three generations, they put in foundations and basements. And I knew growing up as a child that the best place that I could be during a storm was in the basements that my parents and grandparents had built. So when a storm came, I knew that I needed to get to the foundation because no matter how bad the storm was, I was going to be safe in that basement and in that foundation. So what I hope that I'm doing and where I choose to serve is in the actual building of a foundation, a theological foundation for these kids in our church family because I want them to know that when the storms of life come and they will come. And I think that a lot of times we want to believe that if we raise our children in church, that they won't ever have any problems. And that's just not true. I can tell you as someone who had my kids in church as often as I could and had them in programs and activities, they're still going to have bad things come and things will happen and they're going to experience pain and trials. I want the kids that I teach to have a foundation. I want them to know the safest place to be is to run into that foundation and into that basement because the storm is coming, but if they can get down to where it's safe, it doesn't matter what happens, the safest place for them to be is to go to that foundation because no matter what happens, no matter how bad the storm is, that foundation is gonna keep them safe. I think a lot of times we think, well, we'll focus on on these adult ministries and and we'll help prepare these adults. But our kids need to have that foundation so that they can build upon it. So that's what I think that 
for me, my ministry is going to be to help build a foundation so that the other ministries of our church can always help build upon that. If the foundation's good, then we can always build upon that as a church family. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. For those of you that are here, those of you that are joining us online, thanks for, thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in and checking us out. I really love what Jolene said there, and I would just echo that. Um, that foundation is so important. I have uh, shared this with a few people over the last couple of weeks. Um, I would say for me personally, and I've seen this from other, other pastors as well, this has been the hardest season of ministry that I've ever experienced. And now, uh, you know, 20 years of, of ministry. Uh, hard for different reasons. I mean, hard because there's just so much that's happening and, 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 and we don't know what's happening. Life is so unpredictable. It's hard because, you know, we haven't seen a lot of people. Um, so all of those things are so hard. But I do uh, find myself going back to that foundation sometimes of the things that I uh, was brought up learning and knowing and thinking about. And I don't, I don't know how you've processed, um, even just the last couple of weeks, where it seems like things were getting ready to get back to some sense of normalcy, and then all of a sudden, now there's a spike, and now we don't know what's going to happen again. And in the midst of that, I, I think it's really easy for us to become afraid and to worry. Um, here is my encouragement to us to continue to put our trust in God. That when we don't understand what's happening, and listen, I have to remind myself of this regularly, when we don't know what's happening in our own lives, God still does. And I would just, as we think about being hero makers in this series, just encourage you to think this way. As you are around people who don't have the foundation that Jolene talked about, live missionally and look for opportunities to share your faith and why you are not afraid in the midst of everything that's happening because of your faith and trust in God, knowing that he's in control, even if we are not. Let me pray for us. Father, as we come before you this morning, we just lift up our community. And God, ultimately our state as well, as now there is a spike in coronavirus cases. And Father, I pray for um, just the hearts and attitudes of everyone um, Father, that in the midst of all the unknowns that are happening in our lives, uh, God, that we would continue to put our trust in you and that you would give us the opportunities to point others back to you as well. Father, certainly I pray for those who are sick. I pray that you would bring healing in their lives. I pray that the case numbers would go down um, and would go down quickly. Um, Father, I pray that you would give us Wisdom to know how to live wisely in the midst of this time that you would keep us safe and healthy as well. God, we just recognize our dependence upon you. And I think about the song that we sang this morning. May the cry of our hearts be that we want you in our lives, not just the things that you can do for us, but that we would just want you in these moments, God, that we would just cry out for you and sense you at work in our lives. Be with us over the next few minutes as we look at your word. I, I pray that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us, that you would teach us through the work of your Holy Spirit within us today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So I want to know, how many of you uh, watch The Voice or have watched The Voice? So we've got a few hands here. I see those hands um, also for those of you that are watching online. Um, I actually have always wanted to say that. I don't have a unique special ability to see you with your hand up. And that's funny, so you guys can laugh. There you go. That's helpful. So it helps me feel better about myself. So I haven't like religiously watched The Voice, just seen it a few times. For those of you that aren't familiar with The Voice, it is a singing competition show where there are celebrity coaches. And the uniqueness about it is that the first uh, stage of the competition are blind auditions. So the coaches evaluate the singers simply based off of what they hear. And so what happens is if they like somebody, they hit a button on their chair and it turns around. That indicates that they are interested in having this person on their team. I will tell you that I could never be on that show. 
Now, some of you don't know this about me. Uh, we have some staff members who make fun of me about this, Wayne and Cody specifically. Uh, I grew up singing, just in choirs and things like that. So I, Now, I will tell you, I do not have the talent and ability to be on that show. I, I know that, but even if I did, I couldn't be on that show because my thought is, if I were to go do my thing, sing my song, what would happen if nobody turned around? I would absolutely be devastated, and I would probably never sing again in my life, even if most people in the world thought that I was a really good singer because those four people said I wasn't good enough, I would just quit. I even think about it this way, like what would happen if only one person turned around? My focus would not be on that one person that wanted me to be on their team, but the three people who thought that I wasn't good enough. And so I just really would struggle with self-doubt, wondering why I was even there. But then sometimes I even think this way. But this only in my wildest imagination could I ever imagine what this would be like. What would happen if I were on that show and all four judges hit their button turn their chairs around, and at the bottom of their chairs, it says, I want you. I just think for me, who sometimes struggles with self-doubt, and if you were in that situation, I wonder if this would do the same thing for you. For anybody who struggles with self-doubt, like all of a sudden, these four judges turn around, all fighting over you to be a part of their team. How encouraging that would be, how life-giving that would be, and confidence-building that would be, how much of a difference that would make. I grew up playing team sports, but never really was in a situation where there were, like, tryouts. My school was small enough, if you just kept showing up, usually they gave you a spot on the team. So I don't know that there were ever cuts that were made. I think maybe sometimes we did in basketball, but it was a little bit more self-evident. Like, you just, the people that weren't going to make it, like, stopped showing up. So there was never a list and things like that. So at the same time, so I grew up playing sports, but was never really good enough to play in college, and so didn't have this experience either where, like, being recruited. And I think about that sometimes, where, again, like, I kind of struggled with wondering where I fit in terms of how good I was with, in comparison to other people and all of that, and I think how different it would have been if I would have had coaches show up at games saying, hey, we want you to be a part of what we're doing. We want you to be a part of our program. For me, again, who struggles with self-doubt, I, I, like, I think that would have made a tremendous difference in terms of how I viewed my own abilities. I, I, want, I haven't had this experience either. I wonder if maybe some of you have, where either a headhunter or maybe a former boss who moved to a different company just called you up out of the blue and offered you a job. Not because you were out of work, not because you were even looking for a job, but just because they identified something in you that was good enough that they wanted you to be a part of what they were doing. And again, if you ever wondered how you fit in your own field, if that ever happened to you, how it would just like put some wind in your sails that you begin to believe in yourself and what you're doing so much because somebody wants you to be a part of what they're doing. I'm a little bit hesitant to tell you about this for fear that some of you might ask me to do something that I would have to get out of. But over the years, I've had the opportunity to do some different things outside of my specific responsibilities here at the church. Serve on a couple of different boards, just do some different teaching and things like that. And I rarely say no, almost always say yes. And you want to know why? Just because it means so much that somebody else has seen something in me and said, hey, I want you to do that. Because it's so life-giving and confidence building. It's like this person saw something in me and they want me to be a part of what they're doing. And so I almost always say yes. As we continue our Hero Maker series today, we talked about the I see in you conversations a couple of weeks ago. Remember, those are the conversations that we have where we're affirming something positive in the life of somebody else, if maybe a character quality or an ability that they have, something like that. That's the I see in you conversation. Well, really what we're talking about today is taking those I see in you conversations to the next level because now it's not just I see this thing in you, but I see this thing in you and I want you to actually be a part of what 
I'm doing. Or I want you to use that gift, that ability, whatever it is, you can make a difference in what we are doing. Now, it's entirely possible that some of you have never heard that in your entire life. And in fact, maybe you've actually heard the exact opposite of that. Like growing up, you never heard those positive affirmations, but what you heard was you'll never amount to anything. You'll never be good enough. I've said this before. I want to say it again. If you are a follower of Christ, you have something to give because Jesus has given it to you. And because you're a follower of Christ who has something to give, if you are a part of our church, we want you to be a part of what God is doing through us. We want you to be a part of this team. And I think those of us who are leaders in this church, we need to be sharing that message with people on a regular basis. In part, that's what a hero maker does. It identifies those positive qualities in other people and says, hey, join us in what we are doing. Now, having said that, though, In the concept of a team where there are people involved, and there's always going to be people involved, it's not always going to be pretty. Because you might find yourself in a situation where you see something in somebody that somebody else doesn't see, and maybe some conflict arises. Well, here is Hero Maker rule number four. Hero Makers fight for people. Hero Makers fight for people. And we're going to see that today as we look at the Hero Maker of Barnabas. And so if you've got a Bible, I would invite you to turn there with me to Acts chapter 15. We're going to be in verses 36 through 41. Acts chapter 15, if you don't have a Bible in front of you, it will be on the screen as I read it, or if you are a version Bible app user, you can navigate your way to our live event and follow along. Here is Acts 15, starting in verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return And visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had gone with them and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. It might seem strange that in the middle of our Hero Maker series, we're looking at a passage of Scripture where there is a conflict. We'll talk a little bit about that. This section does cover this conflict between Paul and Barnabas. But what I want to just point out to you from the very beginning, nowhere does it say that Paul was right and Barnabas was wrong. It also doesn't say that Barnabas was right and Paul was wrong. What we read is just like, here are the facts of the situation. And I don't think that this conflict was necessarily a good thing, but God sometimes takes bad things and uses them for good purposes, and that's what we have in this case, that God multiplies the effort to reach the the world with the gospel through the separation of Paul and Barnabas. If I were to take time this morning, which we're not going to do that, but if we were to take time to do a little bit of a survey, and I were to ask you who has heard of the Apostle Paul, knows something about what Paul did, likely most people would say, yes, I've in fact heard of Paul. I could tell you something that he did. At the same time, if if I were to ask the question, hey, how many of you have heard of Barnabas before and could tell me something that Barnabas did, my guess would be that the number would be less. Maybe you heard of Barnabas, but like in terms of like exactly what he did or whatever, maybe not really sure. So then if I were to follow up and say, who do you think is more prominent Paul or Barnabas, again, I think the unanimous answer would be, well, Barnabas was more prominent. I mean, after all, or or Paul was more prominent because Paul is the one who wrote over half of the New Testament. So we know there's this guy named Paul, maybe not all the details of his life, but we know something about his story. What's really interesting is that the really only reason that we have Paul and we know Paul It's probably because of Barnabas. Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement. And early on, uh, Paul and Barnabas, they were the dynamic duo. That's how uh, they're often referred to. Uh, 
it was Paul and Barnabas who went out on the first missionary journey. They were chosen to leave the church at Antioch and to go take the message of the gospel to different places, different cities throughout Asia Minor. And really the reason that Paul even went with Barnabas, originally it wasn't Paul and Barnabas, it was Barnabas and Paul. And the reason that Paul went with Barnabas is because Barnabas fought for Paul. When other church leaders were like, man, we're not really sure about this Paul guy. Uh, can we really trust him? Remember we talked a couple weeks ago about, about his conversion experience. And so there was still some skepticism about him. It was Barnabas who fought for Paul. And so they went out on this missionary journey, sharing the gospel with people. Many, many people came to faith in Christ. They started all these different churches. And even as it became apparent, as they were ministering together, that Paul's skill in ministry outweighed Barnabas, Barnabas lived the principles of a hero maker because he was willing to move outside of the spotlight and put Paul into the spotlight so that they could be as effective as possible in all that they were doing. Barnabas was a hero maker. And so we get into to chapter 15, and what we find is that now Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to make another missionary journey. They're going to go back and visit those churches that they had established to encourage the people, potentially uh, correct some doctrinal errors, some errors of belief and things like that. That's what they're going to go do. And so they begin to make plans, plans on where they're going to go specifically, who they're, who they're going to take with them, all of those kinds of things. And so as they begin talking, Barnabas says, hey, I'm going to take Mark. And it says, Paul thought it not best because he had left them. And so what we find is that a disagreement started, a sharp disagreement. Actually, the, the language is really, really strong. In the English, it's kind of like, oh, there's just this little disagreement. And in the original language, it's really, really strong. They fought over this. Because Barnabas wanted to take Mark. Paul said, no way are we going to take that guy because he deserted us. Now, we don't know the, what happened, why that uh, took place. Uh, we just read in, in chapter 13 and verse 13 that Mark was with them on a previous journey and he decided to leave them. We don't really know why, if he got homesick or things got hard or whatever it was, but for some reason he left. And now as they get ready to go again, Paul says, I'm not taking that guy. I'm not putting up with that anymore. And so there's this disagreement that arises between the two of them. It's so strong to the point that they have to separate. They choose to separate. Now, there's a lot that's happening with the conflict that was taking place between them. In fact, some scholars believe that Barnabas actually sided with Peter. Remember, we talked last week about how Peter withdrew from eating with Gentiles when the, the Judaizers came in, those people that said you have to be Jewish to be Christian. And so some people believe that that was part of the conflict as well. We don't know that for sure. But whatever it was, we see that these two once great ministry partners who did great things together, they separated. Barnabas chose Mark, Paul chose Silas, and they went their separate ways. And in the book of Acts, that's all we read of the story. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, he follows Paul's ministry. He traveled with Paul, and so he really gives a firsthand account throughout the rest of Paul's life. So biblically, in the Bible, in the book of Acts, we don't know what happened to Mark. But thankfully, church history tells us the rest of the story. And so what we find, even though we don't read this in the Bible, is that Mark, this Mark that Barnabas fought for, is the author of the gospel of Mark. And so at some point in Mark's life, he became an associate of Peter, and his gospel is kind of Peter's perspective on the life of Jesus. In addition to that, we even know that Mark reconciled with Paul. Don't know the circumstances of that, but at this point, Acts 15, Paul thinks Mark is useless, but Mark becomes useful because as Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he tells Timothy, send Mark to come visit me. And church history tells us that Mark actually was the first to take the gospel to Egypt 
established the church at Alexandria, which was a very, very prominent, significant church in the early part of church history. But I want you to think about this event from Mark's perspective. We know that on that first missionary journey, Mark was just a young man, likely a teenager. And again, we don't know the circumstances of why he left and went home. Maybe it was that things got hard. Maybe he got homesick. Maybe he looked at the things that they were doing and said, I can't do that. But maybe as soon as Mark got home, he regretted his decision. Maybe when Mark was home, he he just was devastated by the decision that he made because he felt like he maybe had ruined his life. Because he still felt like God was calling him to be a part of taking the message of Jesus out to the world. And so maybe he struggled with self-doubt, wondering whether or not he would ever be able to do anything again. And then he heard about Barnabas, who fought for him. Who said, I want you to be a part of my team because I see something positive in you. And I think you have something to give to what we're doing. And maybe it was that experience knowing that Barnabas fought for him, maybe that changed the course of his life. Maybe that gave him the confidence to do what he went out to do later in his life. Maybe that was the life-changing experience that he had, knowing that somebody fought for him. And as hero makers, we need to be fighting for people. Part of the reason that we need to do that is because We see the potential in people. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, too, where we see beyond what was because of the potential of what God can do. And so we need to be looking at the potential of other people. We're not looking for finished products, but looking for people with potential. I mean, that's what Jesus did as he appointed the 12 as his disciples. He wasn't looking for the best and the brightest, but he was looking for people with potential. He gathered around himself a ragtag group of people that included fishermen like Peter and John and a tax collector like Matthew. And Jesus poured himself into those disciples and developed them, and they were the ones who set out to change the world. Hero makers fight for people because they see potential. It's funny, I often think of sports analogies as I'm I'm thinking through principles in Scripture, and I thought about this one. Back in the, especially in the late 90s, early 2000s, in baseball, the Yankees had more money than everybody else. And so at the end of every year, they would look at the weaknesses on their team and then look at free agents and say, we're getting the best free agent out there, and we'll just pay them more money than everybody else, and they'll come to be a part of our team. And so that's how they maintained success over a long period of time, just spending more money than everybody else. Other teams looked at what the Yankees were doing and said, listen, we'll never have the money that the Yankees do. We can't compete with them. We have to have a different strategy. And so some teams began to focus on drafting and development, draft and development. It's not about spending the most money because we can't afford to do that, but we can draft and develop. We can find people that have players that have potential, draft them into our organization and develop their abilities, and that's how we'll be successful. That is to be the church. We are not looking for finished products, but all of us, especially those of us who want to be disciple makers, hero makers, those of us who would consider ourselves to be leaders in this church, we have to be about the process of drafting and developing, drafting and developing, looking around for people that have potential, pouring ourselves into their lives and developing them because there is something that God wants to do through their lives too. And think about the difference that that's made in your life. The people that have poured themselves into you so that you could get to where you are today. Be that kind of hero maker for somebody else. Just draft and develop. Hero makers fight for people because they see potential. Part of the reason that we are able to see potential in people is because we believe in the power of God's grace. As we look around and evaluate people, you know, we 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 do have a tendency to look at maybe talents and abilities, maybe we look at things like personality, and all of those things are really good, yet at the same time, there's an X factor as we are evaluating the potential in other people, and that's God's grace. 
It's the goodness of God that he extends to us that can radically change the course of our lives. And so we can't miss that factor as we are looking at the potential of people. We believe in people's potential not because of who we are as leaders, maybe to invest in them, though we need to be doing that, but because we believe in the power of God's grace to radically transform people's lives. Hero makers fight for people because they see potential, because we believe in the power of God's grace. And here's the last reason that hero makers fight for people. It's because we know that everyone needs someone who believes in them. Everyone needs someone who believes in them. And again, you've probably had that experience. I look back on my life and there have been times where I've been plagued with self-doubt and I had that person speak into my life saying, hey, I believe in you. I believe that you can do this. And we need to be those people for others because everyone needs someone who believes in them. And that's what being a hero maker is all about. So here's your hero maker challenge for this week. You know, normally around the middle of the summer, we begin to look ahead towards the fall ministry season and we're looking for people to serve and, and, and to commit to serving over the next ministry season um, throughout the, the fall and the spring I want us as ministry leaders or if you are serving in ministry to begin thinking this way. And I want you, I'm going to challenge you as a ministry leader or even someone who is serving in ministry somewhere in our church to find somebody who you can say, I want you to be on my team. And that way you can begin to develop that person, their character, their abilities, whatever it is, so that they can be used by God to make a difference in the life of somebody else too. And that multiplication process happens. So be thinking about that. Who is it that you know that you can say, I see this in you, and in fact, I see this in you, and I want you to be a part of my team because you believe in them. Hero makers, fight for people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see the potential of people that you've placed in our lives. Father, give us the opportunity throughout the week to say to somebody, I want you to be a part of my team, be a part of what I'm doing. And and, and so maybe we can be that person who breathes some wind into the sails of people who are struggling with self-doubt, maybe wondering whether or not they can be useful. Father, thanks for an example of somebody who fought for people like Barnabas, who fought for Paul, and then fought for Mark. And I just absolutely believe, God, that you used him to make a difference in the lives of those two men in significant ways. And I pray that you would allow us the privilege of being able to do that for others. Thanks for the power of the transforming work of your grace and continue to change all of us and help us to reflect who you are in all that we do. And may you be honored and glorified in it. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. His work saves down through generations past. From creation to Savior to the world we now see. Our God is sovereign in the power he keeps. Our God is the healer who will never change. Defender of the weak and a shield for the safe. And he binds up the broken and he raises the dead. Well, if our God is for us, then who can be against on the south? His love we will never be 
separated from Neither angel or demon or nothing above Neither principalities or government of men We'll be able to remove the provision in his hands. Word goes forth. His word goes forth unhindered, untamed. He calls out the sons and the daughters by name. And on white stone, a new name will be written. To recall the grace shown and to never forget Hallelujah We exalt you Hallelujah We exalt you Turns on a white horse he'll ride. And his eyes are ablaze with the justice to rise. Faithful and true. Crucified, oh, chimes of freedom, eternal will reign, for you reign supreme, our God and our King reign supreme, for you reign supreme, our God and our King. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, if you have wanted to, and uh, we have an opportunity for you to give and partner with what we're doing um, here at the table, you can do that online, um, or you can uh, do that as you exit the building. Um, we're so thankful that you're here with us this morning. Uh, we can't wait to see you again. Be safe. Uh, we love you. We'll see you next week. Thank you for watching. 
For more information on The Table Community Church, visit us at our website at www.thetablecc.com.